Hey guys, it's Q&A Tuesday. Start off with a question from a gentleman by the name of Nicholas. A quick one here. What do you think of the new Cartier Pasha and what will it do to the vintage model? Thanks, Nicholas. Uh, the answer is very simple. I like the new Cartier Pasha. I've always liked the Cartier Pasha. Uh, personal story, that was the very first fancy watch that I gave to my wife. I gave her a stainless steel Pasha on a bracelet, 38 millimeter with the grill on it. I'm sure Ian can pop in a picture, so that holds a special place in my heart. But personally, I think that Vintage Cartier Pachas, especially the plainer ones, the big gold ones, which you can buy for no money right now, are kind of sleepers, in my opinion. I think these are going to be future collectibles because the watch in itself is very appealing. The brand is there. So uh, it will make the vintage stuff go up. You will see. Mark my words. I'm usually not wrong. Here's a question from Bob. Uh, hi, Roman. I really appreciate your channel and your insight. With that in mind, I was wondering, where do you think the Rolex OP39 in white will go in price. Right now, after being discontinued, they're trading for about $1,500 over retail, and I was wondering if you think they will come back down after the initial surge. I would greatly appreciate your thoughts on this kindly, Bob. Uh, I think the reason you're seeing that surge is not because it was discontinued, but mainly because there's a crazy hype with the Rolex brand overall. And if I, before I would say stainless steel model, it's not even the stainless steel models anymore. Some of the gold models are trading through the roof right now. Gold Skywalls went from 30 something to 40 something and seems like overnight. So yes, once the Rolex hype overall comes down a little bit, you're going to see those pieces go down just the same. Again, not, not a whole lot of collectible plain Jane Rolexes out there if you go back historically. So if you're looking to pick one up and saying if you should wait or not, I would. So um, a couple of Q&As ago, or maybe one Q&A ago, uh, we talked about the horror stories from Rolex ADs. And lo and behold, obviously things came pouring in. The first thing I got was from Clive, a longtime viewer of mine. He's been around since my followers were like in the hundreds, I believe. Hey, Roman, I hope this email finds you well. Well, after watching your last Q&A episode, I had to tell you my recent experience with Rolex. I've been trying to purchase a steel ceramic Daytona at list price since they were launched in 2016, but I can't even get an added to a genuine wait list. I've been moaned about this to everyone for ages. Now my 84-year-old mother wrote to Rolex in Switzerland, pleading with them for help and advice on how to buy my dream watch. She did this totally on her own without any encouragement from me. Rolex responding after a couple of days via email, but unfortunately couldn't offer her any real help. Your story in the last Q&A Tuesday when your friend wanted to panic Aquanaut inspired me to contact you. Maybe Rolex are missing the personal touch that Paddock had. I do have a small purchase history of Rolex, Steel Datejust, GMT Master, but unfortunately the ADIU ceased trading. So it seems I will never be able to achieve my goal of owning a steel ceramic Daytona. I attach Rolex email for you to read. Kind regards, Clive. I guess Mrs. Williams wrote to uh, Switzerland, right? And they basically said, thank you for your letter addressed to CEO. Da, 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 da. You're looking for is one of the most requested pieces in our collection for which worldwide demand outpaces by far our annual production, leading to unfortunately extended wait times for our end customers. This has even more impact this year with the temporary lockdown of our production due to the sanitary crisis. Yeah, I had to call this sanitary. We are very well aware of difficulties finding some Rolex models and understand the disappointment the situation may create. However, our first priority remains our commitment to the highest quality and all delivery requests are met on the basis exclusively. All official Rolex retails are independent entities who receive regular deliveries and are entirely entrusted with the commercial management of our watches. You will appreciate that we cannot interfere in their retail policy. We can only recommend that you keep working with your local official Rolex distributor in London. We will, however, share your letter with Rolex affiliate in the UK for their information. Thank you again for interest in our brand. We'll remain yours sincerely, Stefan Notari, who's the commercial manager. So basically, they told you to fuck off in a polite way, saying that they don't make enough and the demand is there. And uh, they will pass it off to a distributor in London, which will probably not do anything. And at the same time, can they quickly mention the fact that, hey, our dealers are independents. It's, what, it's based on what they choose to do. Nevertheless, it was a nice letter from them. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the world we live in. That's why uh, when the Daytona came out, the first one, and we're trading like around 20 grand, right? $21,000. Everybody's saying, oh, it's so high, it's so high. Now they're like $26,000, $27,000. Tell everybody the same thing. If you really want this watch, bite the bullet, pay the premium. In the long term, you can't go wrong because Rolex has always traded over list. Rolex is not what it is. Rolex's retail price is $26,000, $27,000. And then ask yourself a question, do I want to pay retail price for this Rolex at $27,000? And that's really, really the best way to do it. Thanks for sharing that letter, Clyde, by the way. I'll make sure that Ian blocks out all the sensitive information.
And shout out to your mom for doing that, by the way. That's, that's so awesome. Here's another AD story. Hey, Roman, I've been watching along with your channel for some time. I love the content. After watching the most recent video on AD horror stories, I thought I'd share my few AD experiences in relationship to loyal customers' ability to buy hot steel pieces. Not necessarily a horror story, but here it is. With rollers, you often hear, oh, just buy a gold piece or two, and they'll throw you whatever steel you desire. Now, I haven't been a customer of these ADs for a decade, but the relationship goes back almost three years as of now. Keep in mind, I'm from Europe living abroad, but have stuck to trade with ADs of my home country. The AD where I have the largest spend, I have acquired the following pieces. The Green Daytona, Preen Jamer Hype. Wait, wait Goodbye. A uh, 12615 CHNR, a 178271, a 116506, a 116505 New Chocolate Dial, a 228235 Olive Dial, and a 326945 Rhodium. And I'll, Ian is, I'm sure Ian popped those all on the screen. Some with minor discounts, yet still totals to a rather large spend over the three year period. Yes, it is a very large spend over a three year period. In fact, I wish, I, I wish you were my client. Now, the interesting uh, bit is I have a wish for one hot steel piece, and I've made it clear that I only wish this one hot steel piece at Pepsi. Love the history, and especially the MK3 bezel. Uh, yes, they have a funny, almost respective attitude every time I chase them for it. They refuse to give an estimated delivery time, and it's been over one and a half years of wait now. No application that will bother to sell me one anytime soon. It's by no means something to cry about. I know some wait much longer and probably deserve it more. Yet it's just becoming a funny experience given the talk of gold to steel ratio you need at a Rolex dealer. On top of this, their email communication sucks. T t t t takes weeks to answer. And they genuinely don't seem to care very much, even with the mentioned spending history. All in all, not the greatest representation of Rolex, but what I would assume is a high spending client. Not sure if it has anything to do with Rolex SA, with despite the bad AD service, I doubt they care. Anyway, I hope you can use this example in your Q&A show that even buying a bunch of gold may not necessarily lead to an immediate delivery of a hot steel piece. Perhaps I'm just unlucky picking the wrong AD. I would prefer not to have my name mentioned. Obviously, we're going to keep this clear. <laughs> well, here's the thing. It does sound like you picked the wrong ID because let me tell you something. If you, spend, if you bought all those watches with me, you'd have them a lot more than one stainless steel piece at a reasonable price, right? But uh, here's the thing. It differs from AD to AD. As the previous letter from Rolex said, they're all independent organizations that work based on their own rules, and they try to do as good a job as possible. But sometimes, uh, you know, you get a client that buys so many things and in the back of your head, you're saying, so, well, he's already spent X amount of money with me. How much more is he really going to spend? Do I really need to give him this Pepsi, right? Or I mean, perhaps this is such a big of an ID where your purchase history fails to compare to some of the other clients they have that may have bought 20 gold pieces or whatever it might be. All in all, yes, the idea is, is that if you buy a few expensive pieces, they'll give you whatever you want. But here's the trick. If you're going to walk into a Rolex store and say, look, I'm looking to buy a bunch of these pieces and I'm looking to buy the Pepsi GMT as well. And say, I'm giving you a commitment to 100 grand worth of Rolexes, but I'm only picking those Rolexes up and paying for them as long as it arrives along with the GMT Pepsi that I have. That's when you're going to get the best results. It's coming in there, buying all these expensive things and saying, oh, you know what? I bought all these expensive things and I want a Pepsi. And they're going to be like, well, I'm sorry, we don't really have one. We haven't been allocated. We've only been allocated two. And they went to clients that waited for four years. But if you walk in and say, hey, I'm taking a platinum president, a, a gold Daytona and a gold this and a gold that, and I'm spending 150 grand. But the only way I'm going to do it is if you give me that Pepsi GMT, Again, you'd be surprised how quickly they find you. And in fact, if I'm an AD and I don't have a Pepsi GMT, and let's say the market price on them is $18,000 today, but I got a guy spending 120 grand with me on which I'm making 37%, which is $44,500, I'm gonna go out to the gray market. I'm gonna find this watch for $16,000, $17,000, right? Sell it to you at list, which will leave the dealer at a loss of $7,000 on that watch, and I'm still gonna take a profit of almost $40,000 and move that expensive inventory if that dealer is smart. But some don't really care, as you said. And maybe perhaps you did get unlucky with your AD because to me, I'll be honest with you, I can't think of any AD that wouldn't sell you one of those watches after you bought all those. So here's another story for you. Is it a horror story? No, nah, none of these things are horror stories. At the end of the day, this isn't a matter of life and death, right? This is watches, expensive toys, toys for that matter. So, you know, I wouldn't get too upset over it. Here's a good one from a gentleman by the name of Christian. Hey Roman, love your videos. I have a question, not very in depth by any means, but I figured if anyone would know, it would be you. I see Rolex salespeople wearing their personal watches, some of which are factory diamond day date 40s, 
all go Daytona, steel Daytonas, etc. How much do salespeople make on each sale for their commission? I know these watches are indeed their personal watches, not to put on just for show like some brands or companies might do. Thanks, Christian. Well, I can't for say tell you how what goes on in the, in the company boutiques. I can tell you what the industry standard is in a watch business. Oftentimes, salespeople will make anywhere from two to three percent off the gross price of what they sell. So if they sell a hundred thousand dollar Rolex, they'll receive three percent, right, or five percent. Uh, I can't think of anybody that pays 10% off the gross because that wouldn't make sense. In my industry, in the gray market industry, commissions are usually paid based off the sales profit, right? So a salesperson will get an X commission off the profit made off the watch. And it's more fair because in a gray market, we sell at a discount. And if we're working on an app, if, we're, if I'm working on a watch where I can make anywhere from 5 to 15%, I can't be giving 10% off the gross to my salesperson because that would be my profit, right? It, and it brings up a good topic. Now, as far as Rolex people wearing Rolexes, well, you have, to also, you have to understand one thing. If you are an employee of Rolex or a Rolex AD, uh, as an employee, you're going to get that watch at cost. So let's say if they did go out there and bought themselves a $36,000 day date, times 0.63, it's only costing them 22,000, which is a big difference and something that, you know, somebody as a salesperson uh, in a watch world could afford because these, these guys and girls do make good money, right? This is a good industry to be in. Uh, you know, whenever you're a salesperson of high-end goods, you tend to make high commissions, right? Or you tend to make good commissions. I shouldn't say high commissions because, uh, again, just based on the product that you sell. If you're out there selling $100 items and you're making a commission, you'd have to sell a lot more and, you know, your, your percentages may be high, but the actual dollar amount is not as high. Same goes for selling, uh, let's say, uh, tag whores versus, you know, Audemars Terbions or Richard Mules, right? Dollar high amounts. Uh, waiters, right? I've worked as a waiter in my past life. And uh, guess what? If you work for a fancy three-star Michelin restaurant, you know, at the end of the day, when you bring a check to the table and that check is $1,500 and you, and you, on average you get a 20% tip, that's a $300 tip, right? But if you're working at IHOP and the average bill is $25 and the 20% only equates to about $5. So it's really more of the same there. But as far as the commission structures, I couldn't tell you how that works for, uh, you know, actual company stores, boutiques, be it Rolex, anybody else. I can tell you that for the most part, uh, it's either a percentage of the gross, which is much smaller, or a larger percentage of the profit made on the watch. And, and oftentimes, salespeople also get commissions on the buys, because my sales, for example, they buy and sell. So they get commissions when they buy something, and they get commissions when they sell something. So hope that sheds a little bit of light into that question. So a gentleman by the name of David wrote me an email. He said, Roman, I'm writing it because I watch all your videos and I really like all the content. Thank you. I hope you and your family are doing well during these times. A watch has come up for me. It's a white dial explorer with the orange hand, which is a few years old model. This model is, a special, is special because it has been engraved with a soccer team's logo by Rolex themselves for a Swiss soccer team. The Rolex card has a soccer player's name on it. Do you think this watch could be valuable outside of Switzerland? Have you heard of anything like this before? Yes, I have heard of Rolex doing numerous things such as this. When a big organization reaches out to Rolex, they are happy to oblige. So once in a blue moon, you'll get pieces like this. And pieces like this, are rare, right? I've shown you my Rolex with the Oman logo, right? Made for the Sultan of Oman. I've showed you another Rolex that was made for an old company. Uh, you see Rolexes with Domino's logos on them from back in the day that are still out there, although that didn't really uh, go through the roof in terms of price because it's just a small, dinky, not very appealing watch. And besides, it's Domino's Pizza. Who wants to have Domino's Pizza on the dial, right? FC Basel may not necessarily be the hottest football club in the world, right? And I know you're going to hate me for saying that because I know you guys are a diehard fan of soccer over there, but... Move this man! Move! At the end of the day, it's still a rare watch. And the fact that the whoever owned this watch or whoever bought this watch kept the original engraved back intact without messing around with it, just sealed and bought an extra back for the watch, you know, adds a little bit of value there. You don't mess it up, you don't scratch it up, etc. And the fact that it has the soccer player's name on the card adds to the authenticity of the watch, much like the stamp of the Sultan of Oman adds to the authenticity of my watch. So to go back to your original question, this watch would be valuable outside of Switzerland just the same. Obviously, 
if this watch belonged to Ronaldo, it was given to Ronaldo, it'd be a lot more valuable, but you actually didn't mention who the soccer player is. But even though it may not be the most famous soccer player, I think it will still hold value simply due to the fact that this was made from Rolex, it was made for a known soccer player, and it's engraved in the back and it has his name on the card. Here's an email and a suggestion again from the gentleman by the name of Gary from the UK, the fireman that sent me all those gifts, if you guys remember. Hey, how you doing, Roman? Hope you're well, mate. Just watch the latest what's on my desk. Amazing. Trouble is, I think I fell in love. Oh my God, how lovely is that Vacheron Constantine? Absolutely stunning. So true what you were saying, not that I will ever probably have the amount to spend on a watch, but if I did due to being saturated with what's hot, I would miss out on so many lovely options. Great concept for the show, and as always, looking forward to more. Stay well. Cheers, Gary. P.S. Would you consider doing a show in two to three thousand dollar slash pound brackets from UK, like Tudors and Megas, that sort of thing? Again, I'll say the same thing, guys. Go on a website, pick a watch. Make good choices. Yeah, sometimes it will get crisscrossed, it will get sold or something like that, but I have no issues doing that because, again, you're my audience. I want to show you what you guys want to see. So as long as you email me and let me know, I'll be happy to do that. But go back to what Gary said, uh, two things. Number one, never say never, right? And uh, if it is a goal for you to have an expensive watch in the near future, I'm sure you budget your own personal income and spending within your family and your family expenses. You can just the same budget in a watch. It doesn't have to be putting away $1,000 or pounds a month. You can put away as little as 100 pounds a month and you'll be surprised how quickly that money collects up. And the best part about it is that if once you do get to a price range, of, let's say even $20,000 in pounds, and you say to yourself, well, what are my priorities? Do I actually want to get that watch or do I put that money towards something else? It's still a win-win proposition whether you buy the watch or not. If I did, due to being saturated with what's hot, I would miss out on so many lovely options. And that goes back to what I always tell you guys, you know, take the blinders off. And you must open your eyes. Remember, all types of media, specifically social media today, is geared towards two things. Number one, trying to sell you something. Or number two, growing. That's a social media following, right? So as I said before, if I am a watch account on Instagram, I'm not even in the business and all I'm trying to do is grow a following, let's say a million followers that love watches, so that I can turn content a guy like Roman and say, listen, I'll charge you $1,000 for the next 10 posts to give shout outs to your Instagram and your company's Instagrams in order for you to sell something they're going to post the latest and the greatest. I hate how fake Hollywood is. For those that are gonna to try to sell you something, they're gonna to try to push their own product. And you know what? Whoever's better at marketing today is going to win, right? And because of that combination, you're always gonna see in your face of what's hot. You can't miss out on a lot of things. But I've said it before, the possibilities are endless in the watch world. There's so many watches out there. Before making a final decision, certainly in the very least consider them. And again, at the end of the day, if you still end up going with what's hot, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's why it's hot, because most people want it. Quick question and a quick answer from Mark. Uh, Mark writes, hey, loving all the content, keep up the good work, thank you. I purchased a Rolex Milgal Z Blue, as I really like it. I've noticed the price creeping up, and I was wondering if you could talk a bit more in depth about the Milgals Z Blue specifically. It'd be interesting to hear your thoughts. Remember when the green Milgals came out? It went through the roof. Everybody thought this was it because green was historically collectible. And then the market kind of died down, and the green uh, Milgals died down as well. He came out with the blue. I will give something to the blue. The blue is a much better looking watch. I always felt that the green milk gal is kind of ugly in person once the light hits it a certain way, where the blue one actually looks really, really good. But you have to consider the market that you're in today. Right now, you're probably in the hottest Rolex markets, at least in the time I've been in the business. And I'm willing to argue that this is the hottest Rolex has ever been, based on pricing on pretty much every model of Rolex out there. Somebody called me yesterday for a two-tone 36 millimeter Datejust. I was hard pressed to find one at 7% off retail my cost, right? So I basically had to sell that watch at retail to a client and they were happy to buy it because they couldn't find one at retail, right? That's how hot the Rolex market is. This is a watch that would discount 30%. Any given time. Uh, a two-tone ladies day just, it's just not something that was ever hot or hype. This is where the market is. So to tell you about specifically the blue, I absolutely love the watch. I think it's much better looking than the green, but I will tell you this, if the green Milgauss came out today, it would also be trading through the roof, just like pretty much any other stainless steel watch. Will the Milgauss blue die down? Probably, but not as much, because remember, everything is relevant. You know, when something goes up really, really, really high, you never see a position where all of a sudden it goes from $10 to $2, right? If the green Milgauss was trading at $3 and at $6 right out of the gate, it came back down to four, right? If it goes up to $10 out of the gate, it'll come down to eight, so it'll still be more in relevance to the older models. And that's about the best I can explain it. Hope it helps. Here's a question from Justin from HK. Hey Roman, thanks for you and Adrian's sharing on the market. Bubbles burst when people don't believe the price can go up anymore. Or when 
people just stop buying and trends change, not necessarily if they believe the price goes up, but understandable. Uh, would you have your Rolex, Paddock, and RM, on, or the whole watch market for that matter, what do you think it needs to happen for it to burst in the market? How else are you preparing from the fall apart from not holding on to the hype? Would you spend your capital on less popular items instead? Also, it's been a long time since you last watched an HK. Take care, and I hope to see you guys back around soon. Yes, I'm actually Miss Hong Kong. Uh, maybe this March show will happen. Doesn't look very likely at the moment. You never know what tomorrow will bring, right? And I like to stay positive, so I'm hoping I'll be back in Hong Kong at least in March, maybe even a little bit sooner. Uh, how does a bubble burst? It, there's no rhyme or reason to it. I mean, if, if you look at f previous financial crises uh, that happened out there, uh, that caused the luxury goods market to go burst, right? Uh, or go down, I should say, not burst. Oftentimes, it's when stuff gets overproduced over its current demand. So as long as the demand is there and the companies that know that have the high demand for their watches, they're not going to overproduce. They're producing just in line. They would be stupid to overproduce, right? And that's why the, the demand is still there. So unless something drastic happens, and something drastic did happen, Corona. Remember the video I did a few months back when everybody's saying, that's it, sell everything, everything is going to go to sh I had one guy saying it's the end of the world. And yet here we are, we're in the hottest watch market ever. Even the elections here in the United States. Some people said if this guy gets elected, it's going to be a bad thing. This guy gets elected, it's going to be a bad thing. Look at our stock market, it's been steady. Nothing has happened. People still have money, they're still doing well in whatever it is they're doing, be it their own business or working for someone. Again, there's really no way to tell. And last he said, P.S. Will you be able to offer any opportunities to help out of your HK office for a few weeks in December? Not at the moment. Uh, our staff there kind of has everything handled now. The announcement is it's pretty slow there. In fact, if I shut down that office in the last year, I wouldn't have lost a whole lot, but I would not do that to my staff. When Corona hit, I did not fire a bunch of people to save a little bit of money. What I ended up doing is I ended up biting the bullet because for many, many years, these people sacrificed a lot of time and efforts to the benefit of me to making my company successful. So who would I be if all of a sudden I sent everybody on unemployment and waited till the times are a little bit better? I bit the bullet, I paid the payroll. My people kept their paycheck and kept their health benefits and everything else that comes alongside working for Luxury Bazaar. And I figured, you know what? I've gained a lot over the years I can handle taking a little bit of losses for a year or so until this thing blows over. So I hope that sheds a little bit of light into your question. And I'm going to wrap this up with that question. Thank you guys for tuning in one more time. As always, like, share, subscribe, do all those great things that help my channel grow organically. And I'll see you guys next Tuesday.